Yeah, maybe we should begin. Um, and uh, just with some introductory comments, and I'm sure people will will join us as we uh, as we continue, uh, because there was quite a lot of interest in the seminar. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Ross Upshur from University of Toronto, uh, who we met when we were there in our recent trip. My sound is kind of coming. Is it, can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah, yeah look, it's. Yeah. Can the people online can can the people online can yeah yeah. Let's hope Maybe so. So um, yeah, I, I'm speaking to you from Havana in uh, in Cuba. Uh, unfortunately, not there in person. Um, uh, where I'm on a trip for a week with a, a bunch of uh, twenty fellows on on health on a project on health equity. Very interesting where there's no. In Cuba, there's no different. Advanced health system with uh, <clears throat> with minimal resources. Anyway, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Russ. And I was fascinated by his uh, title of his division of clinical public health. and um, was fascinated to, to explore that in more detail, specifically for our new department, where we have uh, defined ourselves as a clinical department, but uh, all have the aspiration of working at a community level, um, all the divisions. Uh, so we're interested to know more. I think we'd like to contrast and compare with what we teach from the uh, uh, perspective of COPC, Community Oriented Primary Care, um, and uh, uh, some of the differences and similarities, and what it means to be based in a school of public health uh, as a clinician. Um, so uh, how do we proactively uh, uh, um, occupy that space, uh, which is an artificial space between um, individual and collective health? Um, so we're really interested in in learning how you've how you've done it, uh, Russ, or uh, what the issues are, because we'd like to uh, collaborate going forward, specifically as we build um, the new Department of Family, Community, and Emergency Care. Um, so uh, thanks for coming all that way. I'm so sorry I'm not there in person, but uh, over to you, Russ. And then I'm going to ask class to facilitate the rest of the discussion because the internet in Havana is uh, somewhat unpredictable. So over to you, Ross, thank you. Yeah, thank you, Steve, and um, thank you for the invitation to be with you here today and to Klaus and Shaw for their uh, hospitality. They uh, filled me with uh, biscuits, coffee and conversation, which happened to be three of my very favorite things uh, to experience. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to try to keep this more as a as a conversation. I'm I'm not going to be terribly dogmatic or didactic. Uh, uh, you know, you were as Steve said you want to know how we do it. I think we're still on the way to doing it. And and part of the narrative I'll, I'll talk about is uh, how clinical public health came into being, how it was that uh, many of my faculty believed it not ought not to come into being and how we kind of overcame that uh, 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 set of uh, obstacles to sort of start to move forward now, where we're integrated within the new strategic plan uh, that was just approved a couple of weeks ago by the Department of Family and Community Medicine, and how we're trying to uh, build that bridge across to the uh, academic planning for the next five-year cycle for the School of Public Health. Um, so I'm just going to start a little bit with the School of Public Health, and uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have to uh, beg Klaus's indulgence here because I sort of told him some of this story. Public health at the University of Toronto is long-standing. In fact, uh, the uh, School of Hygiene, as it was called in the in the 1920s, was one of the original Rockefeller-funded schools of hygiene. 
And it operated independently, the Connaught Labs, which were uh, a great uh, producer of both uh, insulin and vaccines, and in particular during the 50s of polio vaccine, uh, when we had the large polio outbreak in the 1950s in North America. So it was a, a, its own school, independent, uh, governed by its own uh, dean until the early 1970s. And the 1970 was, was the time, of course, we remember, in which all public health issues had been solved. And so the School of Public Health was folded back into um, the Faculty of Medicine. Uh, fast forward to 2003, and uh, in Toronto, uh, SARS-1, as we like to call it there, uh, Toronto was one of the most dramatically affected uh, uh, um, uh, cities uh, in the first SARS coronavirus outbreak. And as a consequence of that, uh, it, when, can, when things go bad in Canada, we have commissions of inquiry. And so there were several, and if it's really important, it becomes a royal commission as befits our uh, uh, status as a member of the Commonwealth. But there were three major Commonwealth uh, commissions of inquiry after SARS-1, one of which was uh, led by the Dean of Medicine at the time, Dr. David Naylor, who subsequently became the president of the university. And in that was a call for renewal of public health. So out of those recommendations came what is now known Mute, Ross. There we go. Is it, the sounds would be on. Is it just checking? Yeah, can now we can now? hear. Yes, oh, now we dear. can hear. <laughs> Sorry, I think there was someone coming in who was unmuted, and then maybe that was a mute O oh, button. That okay. Uh, sorry about that. When, when did when did I uh, uh, back uh, back out? Should I start at the beginning again? <laughs> so this is a long. Okay. So, hello everybody. I'm Ross, uh, and again, thanks to uh, Klaus and Shaw. Uh, for their hospitality and Steve for the invitation. Um, I'm a professor in the Department of Family and Community Medicine and the Dalalana School of Public Health. So my primary appointments in family medicine, uh, but for the last 10 years, I'll discuss the work that I've been doing uh, in the School of Public Health to build, build a bridge uh, between uh, public health and, uh, you know, sort of the clinical uh, health side of the equation. So I was telling the long story of public health at the University of Toronto, how the school School of Public Health started as a Rockefeller funded uh, School of Hygiene. It was an independent faculty within the University of Toronto for about 50 years, uh, played a major role in the creation and uh, uh, manufacture of insulin and polio vaccines and other vaccines, uh, tuberculin as well. And then uh, in the 1970s was folded back into the um, a school, a faculty of Medicine, uh, which was kind of uh, the, the trend, though, in, in the 70s to believe that many of the major uh, problems in public health had been solved. However, after SARS in 2003, uh, which really quite dramatically affected uh, the city of Toronto uh, and exposed uh, some very core deficiencies in how uh, public health was organized and governed, we had a commission of an that was chaired by our Dean of Medicine, uh, uh, Professor David Naylor, that called for renewal for public health. And out of that came the Public Health Agency of Canada, uh, a, a huge investment in uh, the federal structure for uh, public health and in provincial public health with the creation of the Ontario Agency for Health Protection and Promotion, now known as Public Health Ontario, but also a recommendation that the School of Public Health at the University of Toronto become an independent faculty again. So in 2013, 12, 12 2013, uh, with the uh, uh, benefit of a large be, uh, donation from the uh, from Paul Dalalana and his family, we became the Dalalana School of Public Health, not the Dalai Lama School of Public Health, which many people think it is, but uh, it's named after Paul Dalalana. And you can see here the structure, the facts and figures are a tiny bit uh, out of date, uh, but because we now 
probably have closer to 85 core faculty, but the, the bulk of faculty in our school are uh, status only and adjunct faculty, most of whom have uh, careers in either healthcare institutions or in public health uh, organizations. Uh, we have a large number of masters and PhD students. Uh, the uh, grant funding has doubled since that time, so we're attracting about 80 million in externally funded research on an annual basis. And we're divided into divisions. So the Dalalana School has two components to it. One is the Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation, wherein health admin, health policy, health informatics, clinical epidemiology, and health services research sits. And the public health sciences side, which is five divisions. Uh, one division is in um, biostatistics, uh, epidemiology, occupational and environmental health, social and behavioral uh, health sciences, kind of core divisions that you would see at uh, many schools of public health. And then this unique little division called the Division of Clinical Public Health. And in 2013, I was invited by the Dean of Medicine, the Dean of the School of Public Health, uh, the Chair of the Department of Family Medicine, and the Head of uh, Public Health Ontario uh, to take on the role of building this division. And the division was meant to be the glue between the School of Public Health and the Faculty of Medicine, particularly around family medicine. So we articulated a division that we wanted to be an internationally recognized academic unit dedicated to developing, testing, evaluating, and teaching approaches to integrating primary care, preventive medicine, and public health, that we were going to engage in innovative research and education, all aimed at bringing the best science to the creation of a transdisciplinary approach to systems and uh, professionals needed to optimize individual as well as population health in a sustainable health system of the future. So these are our grandiose vision and mission. So here's the uh, components of the division as it currently exists. So we do have the residency program in public health and preventive medicine. That's a, in Canada, we have two colleges for uh, medical uh, uh, practitioners. We have the College of Family Physicians of Canada. So when you graduate from medicine, you can either become a family physician, which you do a two year or now increasingly a three year uh, postgraduate uh, um, uh, program and become a, a CCFP, a certificate of the College of Family Practice or you do a five years of training and become a member of the specialty college, the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada. And our program, the residency program uh, in our division is, the, uh, is a Royal College program. But what's unique and which I think is a very strong asset in this building the bridge between uh, clin our clinical world and, and public health is that all of our residents in public health and preventive medicine, and we have the largest and the oldest program in Canada, do two years of family medicine and become family physicians uh, before they go on to do their academic training in public health and their field uh, placements. Now, one of the things that happened, and this is all, I'm, I'm, it's going to sound like boring administrivia, but it, it's important structurally. Our division runs and administers the graduate programs for the Department of Family and Community Medicine. We're the graduate unit of record for the, we have a, a, a Master's of Public Health in Family and Community Medicine. And one of the things I've done over the past few years is turn it into an advanced standing degree, which uh, family physicians who have uh, uh, done their two-year program at a recognized uh, family medicine training site can apply for the one-year master's master's program and get it done in a year. We also have these Masters of Science Community Health and Family and Community Medicine, but also uh, in uh, health practitioner uh, training and education. So many uh, people entering into the Faculty of Medicine who see their academic job descriptions as, you know, uh, academic teachers. Uh, as primarily having a teaching uh, focus for their scholarship, uh, they often do the MSCCH and that allows them to become clinician educators. So this, our programs are strong on professional side if they're not research degrees, which is uh, uh, an important limitation. We have the MPH in community nutrition, 
We also have an MSCCH in addictions and mental health, uh, focusing on uh, community based approaches for we have a, a large uh, ongoing evolving uh, opioid uh, crisis in uh, Canada and many. So this is run through the Center for Addiction and Mental Health and a very small uh, program on wound prevention and care. Um, that's the smallest of our programs. We often only have one to two students in it. We did start, and it's now based out of my division, a DRPH program. Uh, we had our inaugural uh, uh, cohort come in last year in 2021. Um, these are usually mid-career professionals uh, who are looking to enhance their uh, and deepen their knowledge of public health, but also there's a heavy emphasis on organizational leadership uh, for this program. The Joint Center for Bioethics, which is a large et extra departmental unit, is uh, um, part of the division. And recently we added an investigative journalism uh, bureau, which is a really fascinating. It's a, uh, an award winning uh, journalist for one of the major newspapers in um, Toronto. Uh, we got a donation. Uh, from a benefactor to start this investigative journalism bureau, which uses the resources of investigative journalism uh, to examine uh, topics uh, that uh, touch on public health. Uh, so for example, uh, or other dimensions. So there's been a series of stories around uh, uh, how driver's licenses are managed uh, and how they're taking, you know, how they're suspended. Uh, they're doing uh, one on water quality. So it's been an interesting one. Best Start program uh, is uh, one that's focusing on maternal child health. That's just recently added in this last year. So when I started as division head in 2013, we had um, 80 faculty and now we've grown to over 200 faculty. In fact, almost, you know, one for uh, almost a quarter of all of the adjunct and status only uh, faculty in the uh, in the school itself. And we have very close ties with the Department of Family and Community Medicine. One is through the fact that our residents do the uh, family medicine training, and second is because we administer the uh, graduate programs that the uh, Department of Family and Community Medicine offers. So I'm going to draw on a couple of papers today uh, that we published, and I'd like to uh, 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 point out uh, the signal con um, uh, contributions of Bernard Choi uh, to this effort. Bernard just retired uh, this week and then I, I sent him a message for his retirement party. Uh, but he was a senior epidemiologist at the Public Health Agency of Canada, who I mentioned earlier uh, when we started in 2013, there were many people in my division who believed that you couldn't have clinical and public health in the same sentence. In fact, the very idea of the division was an oxymoron, and the sooner we could change the name, uh, the better things would be in the world. And so at, at the first few years of my uh, uh, monthly faculty meetings were rather entertaining uh, because everybody was not best pleased to be put in this division at the start. I can tell you things have completely changed uh, and now we're the cool place to be. But in those days, so, so these two papers that we've published in the last two years were the result of a study um, that uh, my own faculty decided that they would do a study to prove uh, that we ought not to exist uh, as a division, but in fact we came to the uh, completely opposite uh, uh, conclusions. Well, draw on that and talk a little bit about this. So this is a story with a happy ending, though. I can tell you at the beginning I wasn't too happy myself about the prospects of uh, the long-term survival of our division. So part of what we're trying to think about is the what's the uh, the optimal set point between uh, you know upstream investments and downstream uh, individual care and you know what are the elements of an ad ideal health system and I like to say that what we call in Ontario a healthcare system is a perfect insult to a nice word called system. We do not have anything resembling a healthcare system in Canada, despite everybody's belief that we have one. This Canadian healthcare system doesn't exist. Each system, each province has its own uh, insurance scheme that has a basket of services that it provides. So it provides under the Canada Health Act for medically necessary services. Those are insured, typically things like physician visits, uh, hospitalizations, diagnostic tests. 
but what's in the basket relative to what people need has increasingly grown apart. And so my, uh, my claim here, and it doesn't earn me a lot of friends, is the mere uh, presence of a, an insurance scheme does not a system make. You have to have something where part and whole cohere. And what we found is that we have a lot of disintegration, a lot of disconnection, and a lot of heterogeneity in terms of what people can access outside the basket, which of course leads predictably to uh, disparate and in unequal outcomes in different populations. So this is not a new story. So this is a bust of Herodotus, known as the father of history or the father of lies. And he traveled around antiquity and basically recorded uh, what he heard verbatim without a lot of uh, criticism. And uh, I always like this quotation uh, uh, about the Babylonian uh, health system. I won't get into the uh, into the ingenuity of the marriage custom because it involves a lottery. But he said their treatment of disease. They have no doctors now. Isn't that what every you know community based primary health care aspiration was like? We don't need doctors. We can do it for ourselves. But they bring their invalids out into the street where anyone who comes along offers the sufferer advice on his complaint, either from personal experience or observation of a similar complaint in others. So you've got huge engagement of the population. Nobody is allowed to pass a sick person in silence, but everyone must ask him what is the matter. Now, this has certain virtues, but where I come from in Canada, in the prairie provinces in February, where it's 40 below in the winter, you wouldn't want to be bringing your sick loved ones and leaving them on the street and waiting for people to come by and offer up their advice. So how we set the relationship between public health and clinical service is a very long conversation indeed. And uh, this uh, excellent book uh, by Dorothy Porter, Health Civilization in the State, really nicely documents all the ways in which different parts of the world have had this dance about where public health sits vis-a-vis -vis clinical care and vice versa. And she notes that debates surrounding healthcare and public health reform continue throughout, you know, the communities. Here, as with other industrialized and industrializing societies throughout the world, the pressures of demographic transformation and epidemiological transition force policymakers, professionals, and the public to participate in the debate surrounding, you know, how the health of the population. And as she observes, the outcomes of these debates in the 21st century will depend, as it always has done, on national histories and cultures, international developments and political will. And I think we've also had a very shaping experience over the past three years with the pandemic, which has exposed, um, you know, certain systems where you have a closer integration between public health and clinical services. You had arguably, at least according to uh, a Lancet Commission report I will cite, a more optimal and better uh, uh, response. So we know that there's pressures, as mentioned. Uh, we're facing complexity, technological development, um, a, a whole new world around inter internet, information science, social media, challenges to uh, expertise. Um, certainly, I don't know if it was the case here in South Africa, if you had as many sudden experts in epidemics, epidemiology, clinical management, everybody all of a sudden was an expert. The fact that I'd been studying, you know, respiratory pathogens for 30 years meant nothing. Everybody had their views, so it, there was a lot of distrust and, of course, as we know, a lot of misinformation. But in North America, we are seeing a very profound uh, demographic transition. So a lot of my clinical work is on aging populations, optimal models of care for frail older seniors, uh, multimorbidity, how do you deal with it, which is now the rule, not the exception uh, in North America. What you're seeing is people in the fifth, sixth and seventh decades having at least four plus chronic diseases. And of course, with that comes a large amount of medication. So polypharmacy is a, an increasing issue in older adults. We have big data. Um, you know, moves towards uh, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning applications uh, in clinical practice and in public health. 
but also a lot more emphasis on quality improvement and accountability for performance uh, and new ways of organizing practice, particularly in uh, Canada in family medicine from rostered uh, practices to blended practices. We've transitioned out of the almost exclusive uh, fee for service physician operating their own office in the community to um, we're, we're trying to move to more team based care uh, to try to provide interpersonal professional uh, support for these uh, complex patients. We know that the you know, SAR certainly illustrated the points of globalization. And there's, uh, again, th as the uh, carousel goes around, uh, people now are very keen to think through uh, the social determinants and issues with respect to uh, uh, health equity and demonstrated inequities in health. And of course, that's something that's been on the agenda of public health for a very long time indeed. And now clinical communities are recognizing the importance of this in terms of outcomes in their own practices. And part of what we've tried to do is find new techniques to allow clinicians to actually study uh, the social determinants in their own practice to sort of create profiles and to identify how uh, socioeconomic and other uh, structural barriers may be present preventing access to care. And we think that's an important uh, uh, area for future development. And one of my colleagues, Andrew Pinto, has started what he calls the upstream lab, where he's looking at a series of social interventions to see how that impacts uh, the health of the practices that he serves. And of course, health professions education is changing as well. We're moving to a competency-based approach, much more emphasis on interprofessional and interdisciplinary research, or pardon me, teaching, and uh, a lot of curricular reform. So these are the framing situations in which the uh, division came to be. So in our Delphi study, uh, we asked faculty members, so I'm, I'm kind of laughing because on the whiteboard here uh, in the seminar room are a series of Venn diagrams. No matter where you go, people who are thinking are always structuring their thought around intersecting uh, and uh, uh, Venn diagrams. So we came up with actually six models uh, in our Delphi. And so the, the participants in our Delphi study were the members of the division themselves because over the early uh, year or so of the division, when we would discuss what clinical public health was, we thought we needed to actually uh, try to figure this out through uh, research. And the, 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 out, the by far the most popular uh, vision is this top one here where uh, clinical uh, public health is the intersection between clinical practice and public health. So I used to walk around before we did this study making my fingers into Venn diagrams. Here's public health, here's family medicine. They ought not to exist in silos. They need to overlap and how big that overlap is, we can discuss. Another vision was this one that it was the intersection between primary care, preventive medicine, and public health. So this would be some of the uh, members of my faculty who see uh, preventive medicine as being distinct from uh, public health and public health practice because many elements of uh, preventive medicine can take place in the clinic. And we, in fact, in family medicine in Canada, spend a lot of time on clinical prevention, particularly, you know, uh, vaccination and uh, cancer screening. And that would be separate and distinct from the types of preventive work that the public health unit would engage in. The third uh, vision uh, was this one where clinical public health is kind of a hub and there's several spokes. It's its own uh, discipline in and of itself, uh, but it connects to a variety of different sectors with multiple collaborating partners from different disciplines uh, to process and analyze inputs from these sectors and provide feedback. So it'd be like a hub and spoke model. And then we had two groups, one that uh, Clinical public health is a subset of public health. In other words, it's a set of activities within public health practice uh, taken in the healthcare sector to improve individual and population health um, that include or but not limited to uh, mostly around prevention, health promotion, and disease surveillance. So this is an idea whose time has come, I hope, particularly in North America with the advent of electronic Paper, uh, 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 patient records where we can actually harness that as a as a data source for enhanced public health surveillance. And that would be a, a really good close collaboration between family medicine and public health. 
And then the other side of the coin is that uh, clinical public health is a subset of clinical practice that focuses again on um, uh, the, inter the needs of uh, prevention, health promotion. And then, of course, we still had a small group who believed that these two uh, uh, Venn diagrams ought not to uh, intersect whatsoever. In fact, they have nothing to do with each other. But you can see there that the uh, the score for that was quite low, 1.41. Uh, and uh, I think it was up close to five at the beginning of this project, but by the end of this uh, exercise and after we got to know each other and started to uh, engage in projects, uh, we uh, sort of turned the tide. And therefore the leading view is this one here of the intersecting actions. And I'll uh, expand on that just a little bit more. So we define clinical public health as the structured and systematic collaboration of clinical and public health professionals in pursuit of common health goals, and that adopting, promoting, and formalizing the concept of clinical public health can facilitate the necessary inter interdisciplinary collaboration to improve health for all. And so this just kind of schematizes this. So one of the concerns we had from our public health colleagues is that we were trying to cannibalize public health and end uh, public health. And this just very nicely sets out that you have healthcare on one side, you have public health on the other. There are areas independent to each other. So there's in Canada, public health has the responsibility for health protection, for you know outbreak management and control. That is not something that's going to fall into the uh, laps of family physicians. And similarly, the day-to-day -day management of common chronic conditions um, in primary care, uh, the delivery of health services to individual patients is not something that's going to fall to the public health practitioner. So there are independent spheres of activity that are currently uh, very much the bread and butter of public health and family physicians, and we're not trying to take those away. What we're trying to show are the large number of areas where the integration and collaboration forms a synergy. And I've already alluded to some uh, prevention, health promotion, um, disease surveillance, research, uh, implementation science, quality assurance. I'm uh, now with, I said, with um, uh, in electronic patient records, we can actually access far more granular uh, uh, data about what's happening in uh, various areas of prevention. We can actually also now, when I teach medical students, because we're moving away from you know, sort of open-ended practices to uh, um, rostered practices, you now have a way of thinking about your practice as a denominator. And uh, as I would tell my uh, medical students, you, if you go home at the end of the day and you've seen three type two diabetics and you've checked off all of the quality indicators, you know, you check their feet and you've checked their A1C and you've done their blood pressure and you renewed their medication, um, you can't go home and rest on your laurels because you need to know what the total number of type two diabetics are in your practice and who hasn't. Uh, come for the best guideline practice. And what you'll find often when you unpack your denominator is that people who are not coming for their regular screening for their regular checkups are facing some form of structural barrier based in some form of uh, health in, uh, uh, structural health inequality. And that's a way you can sensitize yourself to how structural forces play out in your practice. But then you can also design uh, interventions to address these. Uh, with your colleagues and with the data that you have at hand. So that's another project we're working on is a suite of tools to allow clinicians to analyze their practice for these kinds of uh, uh, barriers that might uh, allow them to deliver better care. We also did a bit of a scoping review to look at the ways in which um, integrated healthcare delivery could benefit uh, from uh, a better relationship between uh, primary care and public health collaboration. And we noted that there's, if interested, and we're still working on the public health side of this, you can coordinate healthcare services better. 
And you can apply that population perspective to clinical practice, just as I've mentioned. And the paper in the annals uh, gives five examples of how we thought this has been done in an exemplary fashion in, in practices in North America. You can identify and address community problems. So we've been called the Department of Family and Community Medicine uh, for 50 years at the University of Toronto. But in essence, we've not done much to execute on the C part, on the community part of that mission. And that is now a, a high priority in our new strategic plan for that C, for the engagement of family physicians with their community to have meaning. And we can strengthen health promotion and health protection. And as I mentioned, it's a way to give you a lens to start to see and work with uh, inequities in care. I just want to highlight a few. Uh, I think our window, you know, they talk about policy windows open or windows of opportunities arising. And uh, how am I doing for time? Am I good? Yeah, Okay, okay, good. So we thought that the pandemic uh, actually illustrated um, that this was that was time for public health, uh, which is administered through public health units uh, via uh, that are cost shared between municipality and the and the province. And that this was a time where we could actually make the case that the integrate it was time for better integration. And the best part of this, you know, I could have argued and written, um, you know, tens of papers more explaining why this was important, but there's nothing like a pandemic uh, to actually show that both groups really were critically dependent on each other, needed each other, and in fact, their strengths were complementary to each other. So we were uh, uh, able to do things such as, uh, uh, you know, sharing population and public health data through that entity of Public Health Ontario, which allowed us to sort of see how COVID was spreading in the uh, population in real time. It also allowed us to find those areas of greatest disadvantage that were finding the highest rates of um, uh, COVID disease, which then allowed us to uh, organize our uh, vaccine uh, distribution and priority list to deal with the populations that had the highest risk and the highest need. And so there was uh, using this data, we also were able to work with the hospital sector uh, to proactively plan for and respond to changing case counts. It showed that we were actually uh, able to uh, mount a much more nimble response. And outside of the um, sad disaster that befell long term care in wave one of the uh, COVID pandemic, which I will not dwell on in any detail today, uh, the response from uh, Ontario uh, was actually not too bad in terms of international uh, um, comparisons. But the collaborations we've had uh, also collaborations between the, the health units and the cities and municipalities. So we had this, uh, you know, daunting task of rolling out, you know, tens of millions of vaccines in a very short period of time. And everybody put their shoulder behind it. The municipalities opened up uh, arenas and facilities, uh, primary care, family physicians. We organized a gazillion different uh, uh, vaccine campaigns and public health units helped with the procurement of the uh, of the vaccine and maintaining the cold chain. So and this was just a sense that they were also at the table. Um, and we learned this from SARS-1. When SARS-1 hit, we hadn't had a major uh, infectious disease outbreak in Ontario probably since the you know polio in the 50s. And uh, it really took everyone by complete surprise, but we actually brought tables together to, you know, it was awful, and we do have all of those uh, reports. But when H1N1 came in 2009, everybody knew each other and everybody was able to work together very quickly. So we need to um, really leverage this opportunity to build these collaborations uh, going forward beyond simply uh, concern with infectious disease because we can look at how we can use these integrated approaches of public health, population health, and clinical care uh, to manage things like the obesity uh, epidemic, the opioid epidemic, and the uh, mounting uh, diabetes and chronic disease burdens. 
So I'm just going to highlight uh, that the uh, Lancet Commission, uh, when they did their lessons uh, for the future from the COVID pandemic, they make two points that um, those with strong and resilient national health systems, including public health systems that complement clinical care, have generally fared better. And then going forward, they make a very strong claim for how a strong public health system needs to be paired with a healthcare system centered around primary health care. So uh, the the as I said, I could have sat and beavered away and written papers for a decade, but the pandemic and the experience of health systems during the pandemic have actually made the case for me. And when you see recommendations like this coming out of the, uh, they don't call it clinical public health, but that's in fact what they're talking about. And I uh, always like to point, there's a, a writer at Tool Gawande who's a, a surgeon who writes these incredibly influential uh, essays in the New Yorker. So I always joke that when Atul Gawande says something, even if you've been saying it for 20 years, it's now officially true. And, uh, and he said, uh, you know, as the pandemic ebbs, countries will be assessing what went wrong with their public health systems. And he argues, and I agree, a fundamental failure has been the separation of public health from healthcare delivery. Getting that right across the globe could present our greatest opportunity to secure longer and better lives. And I think we're at that. I hope that we keep this window of opportunity open for how we figure out how to get this right uh, over the next five to 10 years as we come out of our COVID experience. So I'm just going to, that being, you know, all sounds very optimistic, but uh, a few years back, we commissioned a paper um, and uh, for a Canadian journal called Healthcare Papers uh, called, Is Public Health Ready to Participate in the Transformation of the Healthcare System? And uh, uh, my deans now, Stanley Brown, uh, myself and a colleague, Terry Sullivan, uh, wrote a commentary. So we had this lead paper and then we had uh, leaders from public health and clinical care across Canada write commentaries. Uh, but uh, the, the lead authors of this paper are uh, very senior public health officials and they're still leery. Um, so we still haven't persuaded everyone. So nevertheless, across jurisdictions in Canada at this time, though they are perhaps supportive of the concept of greater collaboration, public health professionals are largely restrained by numerous barriers, past history, inadequate finances, resources, and training, and are unwilling and, or unprepared to participate in system change. So I think we still have a little bit of work to do, uh, but I think that uh, the tide is definitely turning. And I just want to also point out, uh, this came out just around the time I accepted the, uh, it's not that I only read or cite Lancet Commission reports, but they just seem to be, uh, they, they seem to be on point for some of the uh, points I want to make today. Uh, but this was uh, written by several deans of uh, faculties of medicine and public health from around the world. It was kind of meant to be the Flexner report for the 21st century, like what are the skills and transformation and education uh, for health systems in an interdependent world. And they talk about third generation reforms and they say all health professionals in all countries should be educated to mobilize knowledge and engage in critical reasoning and ethical conduct so that they are competent to participate in patient and population-centered health systems as members of locally responsive and globally connected teams. So on the education side, we're trying to train in, you know, the earlier you can inoculate people against the siloed mentality of where they end up to have this bifocal vision, to see the universal and the particular and the particular in the universal. Um, and I think there's a, a, a we're trying to uh, transform our educational uh, offerings, both in family medicine and in graduate school to teach this bifocal vision uh, of uh, patient and population centeredness. So why should we do this? I'm just going to close up. Well, the interesting thing is if you talk to our citizens, they think that we already do this. They, and uh, sadly, they think we have a health system when we, as I say, we have this plurality of services. The, the fascinating thing I found, and I've been teaching for several years in the undergraduate curriculum, uh, one sixth of the uh, exam, the, the licensing exam, uh, from uh, undergraduate medicine to go into postgrad medicine is got objectives around public health. And uh, for years and years, we had a one year we had, we spent, uh, we built a spiral 
pro curriculum through all four years of the undergraduate medical curriculum. And most medical students think of uh, public health like castor oil. They hate it and they hated it so much they can they complained and they they changed the, the curriculum. So we lost that four years. But then, you know, five, 10 years later, I'll run into them at a, you know, a, a reunion dinner or something. They go, oh, Dr. Usher, we're so sorry that we were so critical. You know, that was really the most important stuff in the, in the curriculum was about community health. So it, it takes a little while for the, the rank and file clinician to really understand the importance of, uh, of prevention and community health, uh, but they get there. And of course, governments have an obligation to create conditions that to support health, and they can do that by example through incentives to teach through this bifocal vision. But we've got a lot of work to do there as well. So, you know, the idea here is that the uh, prevention is preferable to cure. And for me, the place to start at the uh, clinical public health interface is in uh, prevention and preventions, preventive services, because it also is an easily measurable quality indicator. And you can set up systems to track and, and see that. And then you can link prevention to disease management and prevention fosters partnerships broadly through the community uh, and uh, because people are interested in enhancing their health. And as I said, we, you know, there's systems issues and we learned from SARS-1 and we're going to learn from SARS-2 that uh, there's problems and dysfunctions associated with poor introduction, integration of public health and clinical care, and we all suffer the consequences and it's time we stop suffering, stop suffering those consequences. So this is just a, a, a schemata from um, a British Columbia report that really talks about a life course approach to prevention. And it sets out where in different sectors you can, uh, you know, enter into it from, uh, you know, the principal provider being in primary care. It could be public health. It could happen at the hospital. And you just look at all the different uh, opportunities to uh, be engaged in prevention. Uh, oft times, you know, we under when I started the Division of Clinical Public Health, I spent time with oncologists and neurosurgeons. And, uh, uh, you know, neurosurgeons are very keen on head injury prevention. And, uh, you know, oncologists are very keen on cancer prevention. So we start with family medicine, but we can leverage the broader specialty community to enhance uh, prevention in their practices. And then you could have, uh, again, a tracking system, which would look something like this, where you could, uh, this looks at, um, you know, basically a, a variety of different preventive maneuvers. Uh, this is a British Columbia province on the uh, west coast of Canada, where they look at their data of their performance. They compare it, of course, to our big brothers to the south. Uh, but then also you can benchmark to what the best published standard is. And then you could have annual reporting on your uh, meeting uh, various different preventive targets. And of course, if you link into, uh, we have large uh, linked databases for health services, which could then link to mortality. And then you could track whether uh, the clinical prevention maneuvers over the long period of time are having any impact on population health metrics. So I'm going to stop there. I just want to point out how long in Canada we've been having these arguments. So Canada's uh, uh, publicly funded healthcare system came into being in the 1960s uh, under the auspices of um, the Liberal government at the time. But the architects of Canada's uh, publicly funded uh, health insurance scheme uh, were two uh, people from Saskatchewan, Emmett Hall and, and Tommy Douglas, and they issued the, what's called the Hall Report, which is the blueprint for uh, what we now have in Canada as the uh, 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 medical insurance scheme. At the same time, there was another, as I said, when Canada gets serious, we have royal commissions. There was a royal commission report on health uh, human resources, essentially, in which they went through and tried to anticipate what the needs would be for nursing, dentistry, and medicine. And they had a chapter in that on um, what they called uh, hygiene or hygienic medicine. And they said, you know, several briefs presented to the Royal Commission by public health specialists have been critical of the lack of interest on the part of practicing clinicians in the programs of community health and lack of or inadequate practice of personal preventive medicine by these physicians. And they comment, there's little doubt that most of these criticisms are valid, but 
It is equally true and has not been so clearly stated that schools of hygiene have made little effort to train public health officers to become close collaborators of the practicing physicians in their communities rather than their critics. So this, uh, uh, you know, I'm under no illusion that this is the next cycle of the carousel, but I'm hoping that uh, we're in a different place going forward for the set point between uh, clinical medicine and public health. So thank you for your time. I really appreciate being here to speak with you today. And I'm done. Good. She, she just uh, open up the floor. Uh, I, I saw there were like free comments in the chat, and uh, what I'm okay. maybe going to do is just to switch, um, stop sharing, and maybe also just switch the camera and mic so people can see the room. Oh, okay. Um, let's see that, and we're going to also just look at the, there we go. So, so, so now, now people should be able to see you oh, yeah, in, in the room. So, <laughs> so and, and then maybe, so, so I, I saw there was a, a question from, from uh, Virginia. I and mean, then um, Shukrat and Heinrich also had other, other questions. Um, and then uh, Karen also just remarked, uh, excellent, thank you. And they had a question. I don't know in what sequence do we want it to do this? <laughs> and uh, so I mean, maybe in the sequence that they were posted, that would be, be fair. <laughs> but Jenna, I don't know if you would like to start with your, your question. Yeah, maybe I will. Thanks so much for a really interesting presentation. Um, uh, I wanted to ask you, you know, uh, in the Canadian model for public health is a preventive medicine plus public health. Um, is it only uh, that sort of marriage of clinical and public health that exists? There's no separate medical specialty as far as I I've tried try to look at this for my own work here, uh, my own research, and also for our practice in South Africa, um, because we have a specialty in public health medicine, which doesn't have specific clinical training as part of the specialty training. It's more we see the population as our patient, and therefore we learn all those, those areas of epidemiology, biostats, um, uh, management, uh, uh, social social medicine, and if if you like, but we don't really do anything clinical. And it, there's been it's been a contested area in public health medicine for years and years and years. And the younger uh, graduates often wanted to, to maintain their clinical skills and um, want to continue to do some public uh, so, some clinical work. Yet because we don't train anybody in this. Um, we 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 are not. Uh, it, it's a vexed issue if we if if, if specialists can continue to do um, clinical work because we don't train people uh, in any clinical entities. My, I myself think it, um, it it's a no brainer that. Uh, so I'm going to put on my camera quickly now. That because um, we see the the community as our patient at the population as our patient you can go and do clinical work and you you do it with a different perspective my sense is that you do it you go and see you go and work in a tb clinic you do um address uh, the the individual in front of you's care but you actually come with it with a slightly different lens you look at it from the health system perspective what are the what are the bottlenecks what are the enablers what other community um, factors need to be put in place in order for the, for the care of, for TB, for example, to be a, um, a properly uh, and more uh, with with better quality. You look for the quality elements. So I just wanted to know if you had um, anything uh, comparable yes. in in yeah. in Canada. You know, because the the preventive medicine stuff here isn't the doctor's responsibility. What you outlined really there, the the immunization, the the cervical screening programs, that's largely done by clinical nurses or uh, professional nurses in South Africa. Yeah, we don't really do that that kind of stuff in the public sector. It's not the doctor's responsibility. So the common ground there is a little bit more vexed. 
anyway, I thought you, your comments might be useful. So, so Thanks. Definitely. So I, I can track with that. Um, so our particular specialty training program, uh, different, there are some uh, of our residency programs in Canada where they enter into the specialty of public health and preventive medicine. It used to be called community medicine. So in the uh, early 90s, when I did the five-year specialty training, it was called community medicine. They redesignated it in the early aughts as public health and preventive medicine. Um, some of the uh, university programs do not insist that you do uh, two years of family medicine, uh, but I have been uh, a, a staunch supporter in our program, which is the largest program in Canada, that all residents uh, have the opportunity to get their, uh, uh, get their uh, papers as a card-carrying family physician. One, it provides them an opportunity to earn a living should things actually uh, not work out. But they also then do all of the uh, the fully formed Royal College uh, uh, training uh, requirements to become uh, public health specialists. And many of them end up as medical officers. But interestingly, they've all maintained their registration uh, with the College of Family Physicians. So a good example would be Eileen de Villa, who is the Medical Officer of Health for the City of Toronto, the largest city in Canada. Uh, she still uh, maintains her CCFP designation. Uh, and many of them, you're right, they're, 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 there was a strong dogma, and I kind of blame uh, Jeffrey Rose a little bit for this, and I teach a course on uh, the history of population health. Um, and, and he became very influential in public health thinking in the late 80s, early 90s. And when I came into my residency program, they told me to throw away my stethoscope because I was now the, uh, 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 the you know, physician to the population, but I actually never did. Uh, I continued to uh, and have continued to practice medicine uh, for 35 years uh, while at the same time spending the bulk of my time uh, in a school of public health, advancing population health and public health programs. Um, and there's a, a lot more opportunity uh, for people who work in public health, at least in Canada. Uh, tuberculosis clinics are a good example, STI clinics, uh, sexual health and reproductive health clinics. Uh, so there's lots of opportunity for uh, 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 public health clinicians to bring exactly what you say, that bifocal vision uh, to see the, the patient in front of them, but also all of the constitutive elements of their population and social structure. So, uh, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And it is contentious, as I said, but the very most of my uh, first few years were my colleagues in public health trying to tell me that I had no business trying to merge clinical and public health together, but uh, I still maintain that it's possible. Thanks Thank so you. much. I, I see there were two or three more comments actually was from from Pat and Heinrich and uh, and Karen, I don't know, Pat, if you do, you want to speak to your your comment about about uh, I wish people who work with health promotion, community engagement, and university can have an important opportunity to learn from what is considered community engagement in Toronto and give input on it. I don't know, Pat, are you on the call? Yes, mine. Yes, mine was more of a comment. Because I realized while you were speaking that uh, you have managed to uh, work on, sorry, okay, so community participation or rather community engagement was something that uh, was not, you are still working on. So because I'm more into the community engagement side, I was wondering whether it will be possible, I mean, not, not really possible if we can learn from what you guys are doing as far as community engagement or community participation and also for us to also uh, contribute to whatever it is that you are doing for community engagement in public health. Well, I think we have a lot to learn, more to learn from you than we have to teach in this regard. And part of the reason for being here today is to open up those possibilities for collaboration. So I, I would welcome that indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pat. 
Um, Andrew, I'm not sure if you're still on the call. If uh, you're I, welcome I, to speak I, to your, your, your question. Thank, yes, thank you very much. I think this was uh, really a fascinating presentation. Um, and and my, my question really uh, relates to the unfortunate obsession we have with codification, defining domains of practice. Um, you know, in 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 in, in, our, in our, the profession, the medical profession more broadly, but just be that as it as it may. Um, you know, is there a scope of practice that's been sort of defined or has emerged with regards to clinical public health? Uh, and then, you know, are there any documents or resources available for that? And if I may just add one more question on that, in light of some of the comments you've just made, and that is in that in that you know the five year residency training where you combine those two years. Uh, of family practice with the three years of, of public health and preventive medicine. Have there been any kind of natural, kind of organic um, emergence of, of, of areas of practice that are, that are unique and distinct from both disciplines? You know, has that emerged or has it just remained as two distinct areas of practice that have these occasional overlaps? Thank you. That's a great question, Heinrich. Uh, it's starting to emerge. So we, we have kind of... Uh, there's a there's a group of us who are both uh, uh, public health and and family physicians. So we're dually we have to pay dues and do all of the continuing education for both colleges. And so many of them are colleagues who have uh, supervised their doctoral work. So there's a and, and our primary appointments are in family medicine. And we believe that out of what we've been thinking about in and scheming about over the past decade is a new form of practice that's kind of, uh, I would say, very data driven uh, when the time. So the competencies will be about uh, how to use um, health information resources to intervene and better manage uh, populations in primary care. Uh, so that that's our big vision is that in five to 10 years, it will be its own sui generis form of practice, but we don't talk about it a lot because most people think we're kind of crazy, but I can see it coming. And uh, so that means then we would have to exactly define. So we, we've been working, uh, we tried to get a, a consulting population medicine service up and running, and we tried to sell it to a couple of the uh, chief uh, executive officers and uh, physicians and chiefs at some of the large academic tertiary care centers. Um, and we didn't have a whole lot of success, you know, three to five years ago when we first tried this, but we think we could be a consulting service just like, uh, you know, anybody else, but that's, that's down the road a little bit. So that, that's the road plan, Heinrich. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Heinrich, and, and I think that's a beautiful segue into uh, Karen's question. I don't know, Karen, if you're still on the call. I see you're still on the call. Um, I think maybe also, maybe that's also trying to populate that, that Venn diagram. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Thanks very much. That was really, really interesting. I really appreciate, uh, really appreciate your input. And I suppose um, I'm just reflecting on, on Virginia's um, research, but also on Virginia and, and my training. Uh, at the time that we trained as public health medicine physicians, we uh, it was still a, a, a dual um, or an incorporated qualification together with occupational medicine. So, um, so, so that was where, so we actually qualified, I suppose, as clinicians in that sense, in that we were still... Uh, functioning as occupational medicine. So it's interesting that the clinical uh, public health space hasn't really, I, I just, it's just occurred to me now, hasn't really kind of ventured into the, into the occupational medicine space, just looking at, I really like that uh, those kind of two uh, tiers that, that overlapped in terms of the healthcare integration and public health. Um, but the comment that I was making at the time when I thought about it was that it did appear, and particularly given the background um, of where I ended up in um, in healthcare management, running hospitals and and um, and some health program related issues, is that I often found that the perspective around clinical governance and quality improvement was the space that also seemed to be um, more clinically orientated for public health, but certainly had the perspective. Public health tended to have that perspective versus um, clinicians that often not. 
uh, primary clinicians that often not been trained in clinical governance and quality improvement. So I just wondered whether that um, yeah. fits into your space. Yes, it does, and that's a, a, a great uh, observation. So uh, public, we used to train with occupational medicine back in the day, um, in the in the mid '80s, and and then they separated off. So occupational health became its own royal college specialty, and public the same, yeah, yeah, yeah. And many of my colleagues who are just maybe three or four years older than me actually got their uh, specialty papers in both occupational and environmental health and uh, public health and preventive medicine. But now they're there. I, I don't administer that residency program, only the public health. So the clinical governance and quality improvement is fascinating. So most of the focus, it's become a big focus in family medicine in Canada, but it's very much focused on individual practices. And the way we envision this is training a cadre of individuals who could actually link those qualities. So every um, uh, uh, practice has to identify its quips, its quality improvement targets, and report on those to the ministry. But they're very much uh, fragmented into an individual mm -hmm. practice. What we want to do is we want to organize uh, all of the data from all of the practices for a region. So you've got kind of like a population coverage uh -huh. and then train. Uh, so the clinical public health person would be the one that would intersect between, they would speak the language of the clinician, they would have the skills of a population health person, and they could sort of be in the middle between uh, the, the ministry or the, whoever is uh -huh. the purse keeper and the practices. So what we uh -huh. found, and this is no, no criticism of epidemiologists, I love epidemiologists, I did a degree in epidemiology, and I sit on the floor with all the epidemiologists, but they lack clinical sensibility. And uh -huh. what we think is really vitally important, and the reason for maintaining that clinical training is one, clinical sensibility, understanding the realities of a practicing clinician, two, unlike that 1964 quotation that I ended with, having respect and understanding of each other's words, worlds and a common language. And then three, taking off some of the responsibility from, you know, most primary care family docs, they want to go out and they want to provide care to their patients. Not everybody wants to do population health or clinical public health, yeah. but there's enough people now who either have CCFPs and MPHs, and that could be a cadre. And then the public health specialists would actually be in charge of a group of uh, family physician, clinical public health specialist who had a geographic region. So you've got, now you've got a system where part and whole connect. They can work with healthcare institutions, anchor institutions, they can work with ministries. That's the dream. Whether we ever get there, I'll be, I'll be probably long buried before we get anywhere close to it. Very nice. So just to, to add on to that, I'll give you another Lancet Commission, uh, which is the uh, Lancet Commission on High Quality Health Systems, which, which uh, we participated in from here. And in fact, we were the first national commission to take place. And so that, in essence, was taking those little pieces of quality improvement and putting it into a, a systems approach uh, for, for quality across uh, across the country. So there's there's another Lancet Commission for you. <laughs> so, so the other thing I've been trying to work on is trying to situate uh, public health within learning health systems. So most yes. of the learning health system literature is focused on clinical services. Yeah. So we just published last year a discussion paper on why a learning health system without public health is not a learning health system. Mm. So, you know, again, it's like Lego blocks. You're just always trying to connect people who have a common mission together. So you, you can wish me luck and I'll wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We're great to get uh, the class, the papers that, um, um, that that we were referring to. It would be great to distribute that. And I see Virginia's asking for the recording. Maybe we could get the recording and the papers distributed because this is really, really key to some of the, the conversations we're not only having at the faculty, but also at the college level. Thanks. Thank you. No, happy to share. Yeah. Uh, we, and we have a, a comment in the room. <laughs> I, Sharon, I feel, I'm, I'm like finding myself in three meetings at the same time, but I was listening to the totally yeah. Um but yeah I, I think what you're doing is 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 quite is, is fantastic. I think that we really need that kind of thing. So my, my own background I'm actually uh I'm internal medicine trained but I teach health promotion. Mm -hmm. 
And, and, and so one of the courses that we're teaching to our undergraduates is a course called House in Context. Mm -hmm. we, what we're trying to do is uh, we're trying to kind of um, um, stimulate our undergraduates to start thinking about becoming uh, um, uh, kind of upstream clinicians. Yes, exactly. Yes. So, so that's the thing. But it's challenging because the mindset of undergraduates are, are very much yep. kind of... Um, um, narrow focused in terms of, of, of biomedicine. It's changing slowly, but um, yeah, so, so we need to see how we can we can yeah. learn from each other. In the, in the last 35 years, I've been through probably six different iterations of how we've taught uh, public health, community health to the undergraduate medical school mm -hmm. uh, students. And, and the best one, I, I have to say, that spiral curriculum that we developed was beautiful. And uh, they hated it. <laughs> it was their only opportunity. We sent them, we had built a huge coalition of community based agencies to send all the students out into, you know, um, shelters, to, you know, uh, any number of social agencies, to long term care facilities to really understand health in the community. And they just, they had huge antibodies to it. <laughs> Well, well, I mean, you know, we've been we've been doing things in a way we've, been, we've adopted the primary healthcare approach since yes. 94. And in fact, I was one of the first cohorts that came through that curriculum and has evolved. But I can tell you this: that most of the class didn't like at that point. Yeah, that seems to be changing. I think yeah. that I'm getting the sense that more students are actually seeing the benefits of thinking upstream. Yeah. So well, it's it's nice to see like this cohort of medical students actually yeah. utters the words social determinants of health mm -hmm. as if it means something to them, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas previously it was like they were completely immune to it. So, but I'm I'm handing this all over to some of my uh, trainees who are going to uh, are now leading the undergraduate uh, uh, education. But we got to keep trying. There's no point in giving up. Excellent. I'm just just mindful of about the time, but I think it's it's a, a testimony to the topic and, and oh, to you, okay. <laughs> Ross, um, and the colleagues who are both here in the room uh, as well as online to the how the relevance of this topic. And then maybe just to add my my two cents is is um, in our postgraduate program in training family physicians, we have a leadership and clinical governance module, and and I'm I'm very. Uh, um, uh, encourage it and uh, with, by the feedback from our registrars and also the faculty who consist of public uh, health medicine specialists as well as family physicians who teach on uh, health systems, health services. Yes. And much of the, the that middle yep. <laughs> it's, it's, yeah, yeah. It, it, it's real. <laughs> so so and it, it reminds me also um, of our, our, our recent uh, School of Public Health uh, 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 research day. When, when I also cited the late um, David Saunders, I don't know if you probably knew him. I mean, he's been at, at what such a force. As, um, but one of the uh, his statements that, I, that still resonates with me is about the need to bridge the schism between person-centered and, and public uh, yep. population-centered yep. care. Yep. 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 So, so I, I mean, like you say, everybody has been saying it all along, and I think hopefully we're getting now into this phase where it's becoming reality. Um, if people yeah. actually believe it, that's that's yeah. <laughs> yeah here's hoping. Yeah, yeah. because it, it makes perfect sense. That's the that's the thing that's uh, that's been so difficult to witness over the years. These polarizations and animosities between different sectors that actually public health and primary care in particular have more in common cause. Uh, we're not, you know. I keep telling my public health, and it's nice now that many of them have family medicine. They don't. They know that it's not the great you know, uh, behemoth of acute care and specialty care in hospitals that's going to eat all of the budget. We're as marginalized as you are, so let's form my, <laughs> let's form my common cause. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, that, and that resonates also with the remark from Virginia. Um, I, I think you probably, Steve, has alluded to or uh, informed you about how uh, the Division of Family Medicine has moved out of the School of Public Health. Yes. Um, uh, and nothing reflecting on the School of Public Health is more uh, about uh, a long overdue, maybe reorganization yeah. um, with the Department of Fa Family, Community and Emergency Care. But but Virginia, I can I can go on record here to say that we definitely don't see it as a, a separation of ways. It's, it's, it's hopefully this 
uh, maybe being in two uh, uh, collaborating departments would be an opportunity to uh, yeah, re-energize that, yeah. that common drive. Um, yeah, so I, I really <laughs> do feel that, that, that it's, 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 it's not, a, not a goodbye, it's ex, uh, a, a, yes. an amplification of our common goals. Yeah, I know, I, was, I, I saw that, that you switched out and we switched in and yeah. <laughs> everybody's always moving in different directions. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, I don't see any more comments in this. I don't know if there's anyone else. Uh, uh, I see. I don't know, Tracy, if if uh, if you're still on the call, is our, our, our other deputy dean, uh, Karen is our deputy dean for undergraduate uh, res uh, education, probably research as well, but education. <laughs> um, and uh, Tracy is is uh, deputy dean for uh, yeah social responsiveness and, and community engagement. Um, uh, Tracy, I don't know if you, 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 I know you, you met also each other in the University of Toronto yeah. earlier in August with, with the visit of Steve. I, I, I was online, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to thank everyone for, for your, for making the time this no, afternoon, you, and especially yeah. you, Ross, for, no, uh, and, and, and I, if I may cite your, your, your wife for uh, <laughs> finding the window, your program where you are to free you up. Yes, that's right, yeah, yeah. thank you. And we look forward to our we'll ongoing conversation. Discussion. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'm fully committed to ongoing collaboration, and it's been a real great pleasure. And thank you for permitting me to speak and spending time with me today. I greatly appreciate it. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.